Members of the jury, I want you to think for a moment about how a person can be convicted of a crime that they did not commit. How does that happen? You know, we spent an entire day picking you to sit on this jury. We started with about 90 people. and We got down to 12. 12 people that were the most unbiased. 12 people that were the perfect jurors for this case. And that's you. You don't know the accused. You don't know any of the people in this case. You don't know the alleged victim. But still, with unbiased juries like you all, people get convicted of crimes they didn't commit. How can that happen? Well, it happens a couple ways. It happens when the prosecution tries to lower the burden of proof from beyond a reasonable doubt to something lower. It happens when they try to shift the burden to the defense. It happens when law enforcement doesn't do a thorough job and they don't investigate thoroughly. It happens when investigators are biased and they have a presumption of guilt. It happens when the prosecution calls witnesses that lie. It happens when the prosecution calls witnesses that are coached to say what they want them to say and their memory is refreshed. It happens when people make decisions, jurors make decisions based on emotion. It happens when you assume that someone is guilty. It happens when you don't give the accused the benefit of the doubt. It happens when the prosecution chooses to not present all of the evidence. It happens for many reasons. It happens when you guess, when you guess that someone's guilty, when you haven't been firmly convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. These are all reasons how people get convicted of crimes they did not commit. Members of the jury, the burden of proof is on the government. They must present overwhelming proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. You can't guess. You can't speculate. You don't give them the benefit of the doubt. You give Johnny, the defendant, the benefit of the doubt. My name is Michael Waddington. I'm a criminal defense attorney and I want to teach you in this class some tips on how to give a kick-ass closing argument. This class is focused on criminal defense because that's what I've spent the past 20 years doing and I want to walk you through some steps and techniques and examples of how to give an effective closing argument in this modern era. Now, modern juries don't have the broad attention span that maybe people had 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years ago. You know, back when Clarence Darrow would give a 12-hour closing argument. People want a no-nonsense closing argument. They want you to articulate your theory of innocence and show why the government hasn't met their burden of proof. They want you to do it succinctly and they want you to do it with some type of visual aid because that's what I think we're used to in this modern era and that's what we expect. So in this class, I'm going to walk you through a template and then break that template down and give you examples of how to break your closing argument down to leave no stone unturned to basically devastate the government's case in your closing argument. Now before I begin, I want to bring up a quote that I bring up in every CLE in class I teach. It is this. It is impossible to begin to learn that which one thinks one already knows. Now, I say that all the time because I think a lot of lawyers think they know it all. And lawyers are generally smart and they think they know it all. They think that their way is the best way. I ask you to, to keep an open mind as I present to you my theories and my examples. Um, this lecture is based not only on my 20 years of trial experience. I try a lot of cases. I try about 15 to 20 jury trials a year. Most of those are at the federal level or in the military system, which is a federal system, very similar rules of evidence. I'm also licensed in four states. I've done cases in various states, as well as cases on various courts around the country and around the world. So keep an open mind, and hopefully you can get a tip or two from this class. Now, a lot of us want praise from the judge or from people in the audience. We're not trying the case to our friends. We're not trying the case to the judge. 
Now, there's a quote that I love, and it's this. When a judge compliments you, it usually means you've lost. Every time I win a case, it seems like the judge asks the prosecution, why would you bring this case? Your witnesses are terrible. Uh, your, your evidence is not so solid. Well, that's because we destroyed their case. They didn't think it was so weak when we started. Uh, but when they compliment you and tell you you're doing a great job, that was the best closing ever, often it's because you've lost. Now, as a criminal defense attorney, I want you to remember this. In everything you do, your job is destruction. Destruction of the government's case. Destruction of their witnesses, dismantling and destruction of their entire case, their entire case theory, as much as possible. Think about it this way. The prosecution's job is to build a bridge the, over the Mississippi River. And it's the bridge of reasonable doubt. They have to span the river with a solid, sturdy bridge in which people can drive over and it has to be a solid bridge. Our job as defense lawyers is to stop them from building that bridge. We don't have to build our own bridge. We don't have to uh, you know, help them build the bridge or stop them completely from building the bridge. What we have to do is sabotage their building of the bridge. We have to destroy whatever we can. We might not be able to destroy everything, but we attack the bridge, whether we drive a boat into the bridge or whether we snipe at the people on the bridge or whether we uh, give them defective materials. For example, we just have to destroy and disrupt the building of this bridge. If they don't build the bridge, then they have not spanned reasonable doubt. And you can look at it a various different ways, but if they haven't built the case, with credible, solid evidence, then they have not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. So your job is destruction. Our job is not to build up a case and prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt because that's almost po impossible as a defense lawyer. By the time we get the case, investigation's done, all the damage is done. We're basically given a, a sick patient on the operating table and we're told to revive this patient or at least make sure they don't die in the meantime. So when you're giving a closing argument, it's very important to keep your ego in check. You have to be, be certain that you master what you can control. And what you can control is your preparation, how well you study, your emotions, how well you deliver, your practice, uh, your, your knowledge of the quotes and the material. All those things are very, very important and that's what you can control. You don't go in there thinking you're the greatest lawyer ever because every one of us is learning with every case. Every time we go to a CLE, like I go to a lot of NACTL CLEs and watch a lot of their material and I learn every day and I encourage you if you're a criminal defense lawyer or someone who wants to do that to check out the NACDL website, NACDL.org, uh, take a look at their materials and, and buy some of their books and read some of their materials because you have thousands and thousands of years of experience and video and learning on that website. So a lot of this material that I developed uh, is coming from that organization and th things I've learned over 20 years of attending their conferences. And remember, nothing here is really original. I mean, uh, we take quotes from ancient history, we take quotes from uh, uh, Lincoln, we take quotes from Clarence Darrow, and we modernize them. And that's kind of what we do as trial lawyers. It's a folk art where we take material and we modernize it for our audience. Now, who am I and what do, why should you be listening to me? And I, I told you I have some experience doing this. I've been doing this for many years. I also wrote a best-selling book on closing arguments. This lecture is gonna be taking you through that book. So if you don't have the book, I'm gonna basically teach you an overview of what's in the book and how you can use it. And you can take screenshots of everything that I present to you up here. And like, you're gonna see the template that I give to you in the book. And I'm gonna walk you through that and explain some of those things. If you're watching this on YouTube, I encourage you to subscribe to our channel. We're gonna be putting out a lot of good material. And if you'd like a copy of my book, The Art of Trial Warfare, I'll give you a free digital copy. Just shoot me an email, quick email saying, hey, uh, Michael, I saw your video. Can I have The Art of Trial Warfare? I'll shoot you an email out uh, with that digital book. So now let's get into it. When trying a case as a defense lawyer, you must attack what is weak and avoid what is strong, which means you attack the weaknesses in the government's case from the beginning until the end. You do it on an opening statement, you do it on cross-examination, and then you hammer home the government's weaknesses. You wanna push them into a defensive position. If you're the government, you have to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. It is difficult, if not impossible, to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. If you're defending your case instead of marching forward and kicking our butts 
So if we're attacking your case and you're trying to defend and repel all of our attacks, you're going to be spread thin and you're going to go on the, on the defensive if you're the prosecution. The thing is, they can't help it a lot of times because a lot of their cases are bad. A lot of their witnesses are shady if you do your homework and you have impeachment material. So attack, attack, attack. You want to go on the attack to give your ch yourself the best chances of winning. So when we do the closing, we're hitting the weaknesses of the government's case. Okay, Hitting the weaknesses, we want to try to avoid the strengths because what you focus on is what becomes relevant to the jury. Here's an overview of the class. We're going to give you the template. I'm going to give you some basics. We're going to talk about reasonable doubt. Now, this is going to be the beginning of a video series on closings. We're not going to give you the entire library of, of reasonable doubt, or I would be here for 10 to 12 hours giving you examples of reasonable doubt and other ways to explain things. We're going to give you some examples of them. We're also going to talk about some of the main themes you need to hit on in your closing. You should be able to hit these themes in a very succinct manner. Now, what I've been using over the past couple of years is a very basic PowerPoint presentation. It keeps me in line when I'm doing my closing. It stops me from repeating things. So if you don't use a PowerPoint, I encourage you to do it. Don't put a bunch of words on the PowerPoint like I just did right here. When I do a closing argument, I use a couple words at a time or I use a quote and that's it. I don't use, uh, I don't write a whole bunch of words on a PowerPoint because the jury can't see it and then they're looking at that trying to read it instead of looking at me. I use bullet points. The closing argument template that I'm going to give you, it's really a template that you need to go through and, and look with it like a checklist. Like, do I have this issue? Do I have that issue? And some of these issues will come up in every case. Like, reasonable doubt will come up in every criminal case. Every case that's in an American court, you'll have to discuss reasonable doubt and there's ways to do that. Maybe the case doesn't involve self-defense. Obviously, not every case does. But you can go through this checklist and say, okay, this is an issue, this is an issue, and then you can use <clears throat> the checklist to come up with ways to address the jury in the closing. When moving on from one topic to another, I think it's important to transition the jury. You don't want to necessarily just jump around. So as you're going from uh, reasonable doubt, and now you're going to talk about witnesses, you want to generally have some sort of a header. Okay, now we're going to move on to the witnesses in the government's case. What do we know about these witnesses? You want to highlight it. Make your closing as simple as possible in a way that it's not designed for a PhD student. It's designed for a, for a fifth grader. If you can give your closing to a fifth grader and use quotes and, and logic that would apply to, to an average person with a, with a fifth grade education, I think you're much farther ahead than if you're using quotes that people don't in words that people don't understand. Because you're trying to convince people that the government haven't met their burden. Just normal, everyday people from all different walks of life. Every point you argue should be raising and pointing out a reason, a reasonable doubt why the government hasn't met their case or what the government has felt to do to meet that burden. And you have to make it very clear what you're doing. And another tip before you get started with the closing, I strongly encourage you to not do what I see a lot of lawyers do which they spend the majority of their closing thanking the jury, talking about obscure civics obligations. These jurors don't really give a damn. Honestly, they want to know what time you're going to be done. They're thinking, does this guy get paid by the word? This is my opinion. I know a lot of lawyers disagree, but I like to get right down to the point. Like when I started this, I talked about how innocent men can go to jail. And that's often how I'll start uh, my case or just come out and say, Johnny is not guilty. He did not assault Billy. And then give my reasons why and then roll into the closing. But whatever you do, you need to start strong. You don't want to start off with 15 minutes of thanking them and apologizing to them and thanking the judge. And Because after 15 minutes, your most important 15 minutes, the beginning 15 minutes, they're tuning you out. If you do it, consider trying this method that I'm teaching you. Get to the point, make your point, make your argument, sit down. So like I said, you want to start strong. Start strong with what they failed to do. Have a strong opening line of your closing. And that has to be something relevant, like they haven't met their burden, your client is innocent. Those are main themes. Or start with something like a main theme that you saw in this case. Like one example would be to talk about after they sit down, the prosecution sits down, you can say, you know, you've heard the prosecution going on for two hours, ranting and raving about how they've proven their case. They look at everything cynically. Everything's cynical. 
If the defendant, they didn't find any evidence on his computer, then he must have deleted it. If they did find evidence somewhere else, then clearly he did it. Everything the defendant does points to guilt. Everything their lying witness witnesses do is just a mistake. That's not logical. That's because the prosecution is cynical. They're cynical and they're speculative. And then move on to your client's not guilty. They haven't met their burden. If you get hit with a really hard emotional closing, let's say the case involves violence or there's some emotion involved, you have to, I believe, in the beginning and throughout, diffuse the negative emotion. And I'm not saying to get up there and tell jokes or anything like that. Although humor doesn't hurt if, if, if it's appropriate. Sometimes I get up and remind them, like you just heard the prosecution give a, a closing argument. You probably had a nod in your chest. You have this negative emotion. It's, it's the same emotion you get when you watch the news, for example, where it's all bad stuff. It's all bad and you get this knot in your chest, this negative feeling in your chest. That's emotion, okay? The prosecution's relying on emotion. This is a court of law. We must rely on facts. Emotions have no place in this court. It's the facts and it's the law as the judge instructed you. Here's an example from the Casey Anthony case in which Jose Baez addressed emotion and how that plays no part in the jury's deliberation. No one has the right to base a decision on emotion. We're here for a serious matter. You all left your homes to come and resolve a serious question, a fact. And if you were not given the facts that you need, your guidance will be the law. The law will guide you in your decision and tell you what is legal and just. Judge Perry will tell you that what is important is that you follow the law. We all have laws. We all have lived by these laws. And no one has the right when deliberating to base their decision on emotion. And so you want to try to come up with something, I believe, to defuse a negative emotion, if there is any negative emotion, and then pivot to your closing argument. So these are just some preliminary things that I always advise uh, lawyers to do when they're starting their closing. It really depends on the case. After you had a solid opening, you want to generally give an overview of the law, okay? Not, don't sit there and read the jury instructions for a half an hour. I see people do that. I mean, in some places the jury gets the instructions, they're gonna read it, half of them don't understand it, half the lawyers I know don't even understand half the jury instructions. They're very, a lot of them are vague and confusing, okay? So if you're gonna read jury instructions, do it at the appropriate times. Don't, don't sit up there and read for 20 minutes out of the jury instructions. Make sure you highlight it. Uh, what I'm talking about <clears throat> is hitting them on the burden of proof. The burden of proof is on the government. The burden never shifts. Those types of general legal concepts that the judge is gonna talk about. I like to start off earlier on with that and I'm gonna hit the law later on in more specifics. In my closing, uh, you wanna talk about reasonable doubt. I'll look, give a couple examples of that. You wanna talk about the elements of the fence. Maybe hit on some of the defenses. But you don't wanna sit there and recite the law. You wanna kinda of give them a wet their appetite for what what issues you see legally, and then as you go through your closing, you're gonna capitalize and hit on those legal issues. The next thing that I think you should do, and you can, these things are, you can move them around like, like puzzle pieces, you can move them around and, and, and address them as you think is appropriate for your case, but this is another chunk that you have to address. It's, and this is probably the most important thing, you have to explain the issues the doubts in your theory of case and why it's relevant. Why is what you're saying relevant? So for example, in a case of self-defense, why did the person shoot in self-defense? Because he, he feared for his life. For example, if that's your theme and your theory is that, uh, then you need to hit on that. And you need to hit on that throughout, throughout your case. If your issue is the person's a vindictive liar, uh, the, the victim of a sexual assault is accusing her ex-boyfriend because he dumped her and cheated on her. If that's your theme, you know, lay that out to the jury in a very reasonable way, like you're the professor and you shouldn't be up there yelling and screaming. You should be laying these things out in a methodical, logical manner uh, and persuasive manner so that members understand and track you and be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. No intent, no crime. Whatever your theme is, you need to hit on that. Then you have to attack the government's case, whether it's their investigation, whether it is the police, whatever it is. And you have to have some sort of theme in there. And it really depends 
uh, like in the O.J. Simpson case, they were attacking the government for claiming their cops were corrupt, the police officers were racists, government is powerful, and, and they basically looked far and wide and came up with some crazy theory and then made the evidence fit the defendant, which was O.J. Simpson. Uh, that's kind of the general gist of their theme, and then they supported it with a bunch of biased, lying, racist cops uh, in a corrupt police department. That, that was kind of the gist of of Johnny Cochran's closing argument, if you go watch that. Here's an example from the O.J. Simpson closing when Johnny Cochran talks about when police officers get together to cover up for each other. The male officers get together to cover up for each other, don't tell the truth, hide, turn their head, and cover. You can't trust this evidence. You can't trust the messenger. You can't trust the message. By the way, you can watch Johnny Cochran's entire closing argument on YouTube. I highly encourage anyone that is a criminal defense lawyer to go and watch that argument and particularly watch the last, uh, both his and Barry Schechted part of it, the part on DNA. Go and watch those arguments. It's a master class in closing arguments. And, we're, and I use a lot of their material when I give closings. And in the book, we used a lot of their material Subscribe below to be notified when we launch part two of Kick-Ass Closings and to be notified every time we put out a new video on trial advocacy. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.